All right. <clears throat> you remember what we did last time? Yes, um, which is, um, I guess, an analog of what kind of problem? How did we arrive um, there? Uh, by minimizing the, the action? By minimizing the action. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what is special about the action? Uh, how do we minimize it? We cannot just take the the derivative with respect to its variables. So we do the uh, the variation, and we derive the variation. So We have an integral that looks like this. So the function f is a function of y, the derivative of y with respect to x, which we denote as y dot, and x. And x is the only independent variable. So both uh, y and y dot are functions of x. If we want to minimize, well, we kind of do what we have always done. So we take the derivative of this function and we make that equal to zero. Except that when we're dealing with functions like this, we actually have to take the variation, which, you know, mathematically speaking, is pretty similar to taking the regular derivative, uh, but we only do it at constant time, so it's a snapshot in time, and uh, we only move in um, along directions that the constraints allow you to move it, the constraints of the problem. So we use the principle of virtual work. So important stuff that we derived, and we did it using um, differential calculus. Is the first the first variation? So the first variation of f will be some parameter that goes to zero times the sum over all the variables, and k is the variable index, partial derivative of the function with respect to variable k in the direction a k. And a is a uh, virtual direction or the direction of a virtual displacement. And of course, we want to make that equal to zero if we want to minimize it. So this looks pretty similar to the total derivative, except that this thing over here is a um, virtual displacement. And we also, so we said that if we want this function to be zero, in general, we need 
each of these terms, so for each variable, to be equal uh, to zero independently. We also got the second variation, which we can write as um, delta two, because it's double. And it just looks like um, the Taylor expansion. It will be this parameter squared. Uh, the first term uh, goes to zero because we want this to be equal to zero. So we sum over j and k, partial derivative of the function with respect to one variable and then with respect to the other variable. And of course, j and k can be the same. And then the two virtual displacements. That will tell us if we are at a maximum or a minimum or just a saddle point. And uh, for uh, Hamilton's principle to hold, the, uh, the action doesn't have to be a minimum. It just needs to be, uh, just the first variation has to be equal to zero. The second one can be a saddle point. And then we use the definitions of the integral and the derivative to come up with the sufficient and necessary condition for the first variation of the action to be equal to zero. And it is uh, in the limit of the integral, I guess the, the bins in the integral going to zero the width of the bins. this quantity to be equal to zero. And well, you know, in the limit, this is just gonna be delta and delta. So that looks surprisingly, or not surprisingly, suspiciously similar to um, Lagrange's equation. So now uh, we're going to derive this same equation, but we're going to do it in the actual case, not in the limit. So this derivation, this approach, uh, is due to um, Euler. The one that I'm going to go over, ne go over next is uh, due to Lagrange. So we have, again, this, uh, this integral. So <clears throat> we're going to invent new function, and we can call this function small f. Mm. Yeah, it's fine, I'll call it small f. So it looks 
very much like big F, except that Y is now a function of X and alpha. Y dot also a function of X and alpha. And well, X is the independent variable, so it just stays there. And this function is big F, plus uh, having trouble with the ADA one of those mornings all right so that's pretty so this alpha it's an infinitesimal uh, parameter. So very much like epsilon in the in the previous case, and eta is any continuous and differentiable. Twice differentiable, I think. Uh, yeah, twice differentiable. Um, function that complies with the boundary conditions. So if we just try to Im imagine this function, we have the x-axis <coughs> is the um, independent variable. Um, I guess over here we're going to have y, which is a function of x. And it also has some independence on y dot. So over here we have point A. Over here we have point B. And let's say that big F looks like that. So then we have x1 over here, x2 over here, little f is big F plus some small variation. Um, infinitesimally small variation. So maybe it can be, you know, kind of like this. All right, so there's a small uh, difference here, a small difference here, uh, but it's actually infinitesimally close. So this is small f, this is big F. So 
could it, it, it is a function of um, x and alpha, then it's equal to y, which is a function of x, plus alpha, eta, function of x. If we take the derivative with respect to x to get y dot, then it's just y dot over here. And this one, alpha is a constant, but eta depends on, it's a function of x. So this is gonna be a, eta dot. Remember that the dot stands for, um, it will be derivative of a, eta with respect to x. So small f equal to big F um, and we can add the alpha n so this one over here and y dot plus alpha eta dot and then x This one over here, the definition of y is equation 2.4 in Goldstein. But I'm deriving um, well, my derivation is somewhat different from um, what you will see in the book. Okay, so. <coughs> small f minus big F. Um, it's going to be equal to, oh, I forgot. Um, mm, I guess it's fine. So uh, F minus big F is going to be equal to uh, the variation. So delta of f and there's only one term that remains over here, which is this one. So the variation of f is alpha eta of x. Does that make sense? What is the intuitive definition of uh, variation? Well, we evaluate a function at a spot that is not on the original function, but is 
in its neighborhood. So, an uh, infinitesimally small um, close point. If we do that for you know, every point, then we get the, the path. And so, you know, in fact, this will be exactly the same function for every point except for one. So maybe it will look like this. Same, 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 same. One point um, is in the neighborhood, but not on the function. And then it continues. Is that consistent with uh, our intuition of operation? Yeah. So with alpha, you can make it as, uh, you can make this variation as small as possible. And eta is any function that, well, since you're adding over here the, the f, is any function that starts and ends at zero, so at points A, um, I guess at points um, x1 and x2, um, I guess we can write it like this, eta dx1 is equal to zero, and eta of x2 is also equal to zero. It has to be, um, because the variation, we, we do not have a variation at x1 and x2. Um, it's only in between x1 and x2. So those are the boundary conditions, and eta is twice differentiable. So that's a huge number um, of functions. So pretty general. So now we're going to use the definition of variation. was variation of a function is equal to epsilon sum over all variable indices k, derivative of the function with respect to variable k, and then um, the virtual displacement ak. So for the virtual displacement, um, I guess, yeah, uh, for this virtual displacement, the UKs are going to be what are the uh, variables of that function? So the same as the uh, the variables in in our function. 
So if we want to write out the variation, we're going to get um, also the derivative of f uh, with respect to x is going to be um, 0. It's the independent variable. So we can leave it in there for completeness, but it's equal to 0. So the virtual directions over here are going to be um, n and n dot. It's going to be alpha. partial derivative of f with respect to y, eta, plus partial derivative of f with respect to y dot, um, eta dot, you know, as we derive from the definition of, of y. So, The variation of the integral of f as an operation, uh, we can apply the variance, um, the variation to the whole integral, or we can put it inside. Uh, the integral, so it will be delta f. Why is, uh, why we left f? Because f is a function of x plus one dot. Uh, where x? Dot f, the independent. Here? Yeah. Um, that is the function that we have been working with, but x is an independent variable. So y is a function of x, and y dot is a function of x. I'm saying from the general formula. Here? Yeah, you take um, x, y, and y, right? Yes. Uh, so, delta f um, with respect to x. Uh, but you cannot move uh, in the x direction. So the virtual displacement, I guess, delta. Um, x um, is equal to zero. It is the, uh, the independent variable. You cannot move it. So you're looking you're looking at a point x P, um, and only at that point, and then you look at a variety of them to get the whole function. But when you're looking at the point, you cannot you cannot move. So there's no there's no variation there. So delta x is equal to zero. And so I guess this is a more appropriate way to. to write it. Um, okay, so now we have this delta f. Um, it's this thing over here. So we can write it inside the integral. The alpha is a constant, so we can take it out. And then we just have partial derivative of f with respect to y. The vir virtual displacement is in eta plus virtual displacement, um, partial derivative of f with respect to y dot, and the displacement is in eta dot. And the virtual displacement in x is zero. 
we integrate with respect to x. So now we can do a direct evaluation of the, um, of the variation. So we had, before we had to do it in the limit um, of the definition of the integral. So this one, we actually don't know much about eta dot, but that's why eta has to be um, double differentiable because the derivative of f, I mean, derivative, the derivative of eta also has to be um, con uh, differentiable and continuous everywhere. So we can do um, integration by, by parts over here, so just a trick. Integral of u dv equals u v minus v du. U is the partial derivative of f with respect to y dot and dv is gonna be eta dot dx. So du is the derivative with respect to x of this function, or this derivative. dx, and we integrate this one, we get that v is um, just eta. So this guy over here, It's going to be equal to um, u times v. Evaluated from a to v minus the integral of v du. So it's going to be uh, this one over here. And I guess we can move the dx further and just put the eta in there. So this one, by definition, we've said it before that eta has to be zero at x1 and x2. So this term is equal to zero, and we can, re we can replace the second term, this one, um, with this integral. So let's just put it in there. minus uh, derivative with respect to x and that trick was nice because now the variation of f um, is just a function of eta not 
of um, eta dot. So we decrease the number of variables. So we can rewrite this one. So eta, we can take it out. We are going to let M be equal to equal to that. So now we can rewrite that variation as the alpha, and we can move it to the other side. Remember that it goes to zero. Then is the integral from A to B. of m of x, nu, I mean uh, eta, which is also a function of x, dx. If we want the function to be um, at a stationary point, I guess at a series of stationary points, we want that variation to be equal to what? Zero. Zero? So, <clears throat> we know that eta is equal to zero at A and B, but In general, uh, it's going to be, you know, whatever at, uh, in between x1 and x2. So maybe we'll look like that, or maybe we'll look like that, or maybe we'll just be zero everywhere except for a point. So if we have that behavior for eta, and we want to ensure that the integral is equal to 0, what can we say about m? It needs to be 0. Uh, the fact that it needs to be zero, it's called the fundamental um, lemma of calculus of variations. And this needs to hold. You know, this is only for one uh, degree of um, degree of freedom, one generalized coordinate. Uh, this has to apply individually to each generalized um, coordinate. 
right, so um, we have this equation over here, which is what we got last time using uh, differential calculus. Now we get it using uh, integral calculus. So this approach is due to Lagrange. Um, and this is in section 2.2 of Goldstein. If we want to move from um, f, which is a function of y, y dot, and x, we want to move to the to the general case. Um, we can just. I'm not going to go through the details, but algorithmically. Y is going to become a generalized coordinate K. Y dot is going to become the derivative of generalized coordinate K with respect to the independent variable. The independent variable is going to be the time rather than a position, and f is going to be the, uh, the Lagrangian. And we do this for each k. So doing this, we can recover variation of the action, so variation of the integral from A to B of the Lagrangian, which is a function of Q1, Q2, Qn, Q dot one, Q two, uh, Q dot two, Q dot, Q dot n in the time with respect to time. Is equal to zero, and as we mentioned. Um, this implies that um, that this so derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to Q uh, K minus derivative with respect to time of the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to Q uh, K dot equals zero has to hold independently uh, for each K. So K is going to go from one to what? Uh, to M or N? And what is N? Well, it's the number of uh, generalized coordinates, right? So if we did everything right and we got lucky, then um, n will be the number 
of degrees of freedom. Okay, so we have this equation over here. Often um, you move this one to the other side. So this is minus partial derivative of f with respect to y. We can then cancel out the minus signs. Then we can bring this one over here again. And we'll get um, this other equation there. They're the same thing. Uh, so these are called the Euler Lagrange uh, differential equations. It's actually a system of differential equations. How many Differential equations are there going to be? Depending on the number of generalized. Right. So we have one equation for each generalized coordinate. Okay. So now we're very familiar with this whole variation thing, we're going to look at uh, Lagrange multipliers. What are Lagrange multipliers? Have you heard about them? Yes, somewhere? Yeah? Before the homework? Okay. So let's consider a function f, big F, and it's a function of u1, u2, un. If this is a nice function, we got lucky and we did everything right, or we did everything right and we got lucky, um, then F will be at a stationary point if the variation of F is equal to zero. So from the definition of variation, uh, derivative of F with respect to U1, delta U1, plus derivative of f with respect to u2 delta u2 plus dot 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 
derivative of f with respect to u n delta u n. So this is equal to zero and each of the terms independently is equal to zero. So now consider that, um, unfortunately, we got this constraint um, at the very end of our problem. And it is a holonomic constraint. So we can write it as small f. Um, this is a different small f than before. So, if you remember, um, holonomic constraints can be written in this form. Function of these variables equals zero. So, um, the problem now is that since we have a constraint, what is going to happen to the number of independent variables? It's going to drop. If we have one constraint, the number of independent variables is going to drop by one, right? Um, that means that we have, th this is not um, uh, piecewise, so term by term, equal to zero. Because we have some dependence, now one or more of these terms uh, it's not going to be equal to zero. So that messes up um, our variation. We can, and I think we have um, done this before, try to implement, you know, get one of these variables in terms of the other ones and um, remove it. But that, in general, can be time consuming. We want to decrease the number of terms over here by one. So reduce the number of variables by one. Because now we only have n minus one independent variables, and we want these to be equal uh, to zero. So. What we're going to do, this trick was invented by Lagrange, and hence the name Lagrange multipliers. If we take the variation of small f, that is equal to partial derivative of small f with respect to u1 delta u1 partial derivative of small f with respect to u2 delta u2 plus dot 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 plus partial derivative of small f with respect to u n delta u n in the holonomic constraint f was equal to 0 so what is the variation of the holonomic constraint equal to? Well, if the function is zero, the derivative of that function is also equal to zero. So now we have uh, this, this equation. 
we can multiply this whole thing times lambda that's equal to lambda times zero, which is equal to zero. So this whole thing is equal to zero. That means that we can add it to any function and well, the original function will still hold or be true. So what if we put it here in big F, Since this thing is equal to zero, well, the variation of f is still equal to zero. But now we can rearrange the terms. We're gonna have the sum over variable index k of the partial derivative of big F with respect to uk. And then we have uh, the delta u1 over here, delta u1 over here. So we can put those terms together. It's plus delta. I mean, uh, lambda, uh, partial derivative of the constraint with respect to variable k. That um, whole thing is multiplied times delta uk. So lambda over here is um, the uh, undetermined factor. Uh, this is true for any value of lambda. Since you know, that sum is equal to zero. But now we can get smart about this problem and find a value of lambda such that we get rid of the last variable. So we want lambda such that going to eliminate the last variable. So derivative of f with respect to un plus lambda, uh, partial derivative of the constraint with respect to un uh, equals zero. So in this case, the lambda will have a specific value and will be determined. 
pretty clever. So now imagine that instead of one constraint, we have a bunch of them. So we're going to have f1, which is a function of u1, u2, un equals 0. Let's say that we have m of these constraints. They're um, holonomic constraints, so we can always write them in this form. So now instead of uh, one variation, we are going to have m um, constraint variations. So delta f1, and we multiply that times lambda 1. It's going to be equal to lambda 1 partial derivative, uh, partial derivative of the constraint with respect to this variable, variation in this variable, then we have u2, then we have un, so all the, all the variables, And if the constraint is equal to zero, the variation of the constraint is equal to zero, and the product of the variation of the constraint and some indeterminate, undetermined uh, factor lambda um, is still equal to zero. So we get a bunch of these. And we can add each one of these, you know, since it is equal to zero, we can add it to the variation of the main function, big F. So this is going to be the variation whole thing uh, plus um, similar terms for each variation plus the last variation. 
whole thing is still equal to zero. Good. So we can factorize that whole sum. Actually, we can express it more compactly. variation of f is the sum over all the uh, variable indices We want that whole thing to be um, equal to zero. We want to eliminate, instead of one variable, the last one. Now we want to eliminate variables n minus m plus one to n, right? So we get m constraints. We're going to eliminate m degrees of freedom. That means that we want We want to enforce that this is equal to zero. So how many of these equations are we going to have? Well, k is between n minus n plus one and n. So how many of these equations are we gonna have? If we have m constraints, we can eliminate um, m variables. And we're going to have one of these equations for each variable. In the case when we had only one constraint, we only had to find one value of lambda. Now we have to find m values of lambda. So we have m equations and m variables. So the variables are the lambdas, right? We have to um, find them such that each of these equations is equal to zero. So we're gonna get Once we eliminate them, the variation of m is going to be equal to the sum of indices from k, um, variable indices, indices 
okay from 1 to n minus m That whole thing is equal to zero. But now, we decrease the number of variables um, by the number of constraints. And so that means that each of the indices, each of the variables that remain in this sum um, are independently equal to zero. So this whole thing So this equation holds for each k So this equation for the variation of f we can rewrite it as um, delta f plus lambda 1 delta small f 1 plus lambda 2 delta f 2 plus dot 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 plus lambda m delta fm and that whole thing is equal to zero. The variation of this one is zero, the variation of each of these is zero. The variation as an operation is uh, distributive so we can rewrite this as um, delta of f plus lambda 1 f1 plus dot 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 plus lambda m constraint m is equal to 0. So now, um, I guess I need to get rid of this one, but this is what it means. We can define a function f bar that is equal to f plus f1 F2, Fm, um, oh, delta, 1, delta 2, delta M, and the variation of F bar, which is this, um, is equal to 0. So this allows us to reinterpret the Lagrange's equation when we have constraints. So when we have constraints, we don't want the stationary value of f. We want the stationary value of f bar, which is f plus um, all the constraints. So just three more minutes. So the integral um, of the action 
when we have constraints, uh, it's not gonna be of the Lagrangian, it's gonna be of Lagrangian bar. So this is equal to the original Lagrangian plus um, all of these terms over here. So if you want the action, the variation of the action, it's gonna be dt sum over all i, i to n, derivative respect to time, the Lagrangian with respect to um, Q dot minus derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to QK plus thing is equal to zero. In this case, not necessarily all the ends are uh, linearly independent, uh, but we can use the equations that we derived before to make them independent. So we will have DDT zero, either because we find the lambdas that make the equation equal to zero, um, and w once we do that, for the remaining n, the virtual displacements um, are going to be zero, because they're virtual displacements. So if we move uh, this one to this other side, this is equal to minus this, and this is the generalized force. So you can see that each of the constraints is related to the force that, um, that is constraining uh, the system. This is equation uh, 2.22 in Goldstein. And I think it has uh, typos. I guess I use alpha and A interchangeably. Not the first typo that I noticed in the book. So, yep, pretty easy. Um, questions or anything? I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>